my shame Who could carry that kind away It was my turn Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my turn Till I met this morning, would you just stand and sing with us, um, my Redeemer lives, come on now, sing with us, I know you rescued my soul, his blood is covered my sin, I believe, I believe.
Our scripture passage this morning is found from John chapter 20. We'll be reading the whole chapter this morning. And it begins like this. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter, the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Therefore they went out, and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb. And they both ran together with the other disciple. Out ran Peter, yet he did not go. Then Simon Peter came in and followed him. And went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there. And the handkerchief had been around his head, and not lying with the linen cloths, but folded them together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, and that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept and, and, and stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one on, at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had, had been laying. And she, he said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to him, Because they have taken away my Lord, I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, please tell me where you have laid him, and I will, I will take him away. But Jesus said to her, Mary, and, and she turned to him, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. And, and Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I'm ascending to my father and your father and to my God and to your, your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that she had spoken, he had spoken these things to her. Then in the same day at the evening between the first day and the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled, the fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst of them and said, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven of them. If you retain the sins of any, they are re retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciple therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. And so he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the prints of his nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas with them. Jesus came to the doors between being, being shut and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. And then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands. And, and reach here, reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me and you have believed, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly did, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which were not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that, that, that believing you may have life in his name. How great the chasm 
that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living who could imagine so great a mercy what heart could fathom such boundless grace the god of ages stepped down from glory to where my sin and bear my shame the cross is spoken and i'm forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior i'm yours forever jesus christ my living set me free hallelujah death has lost his grip on me you have broken every chain there's salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope hallelujah praise the one who set me free salvation in your name jesus christ my living hope then came the morning that sealed the promise your buried body began to breathe out of the sun the roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me then came the morning that sealed the promise your very body began to break out of the sound
Father God, you are the overcomer of sin and death, and we praise you. Father God, we declare that there's salvation is found in none other than Jesus Christ, our Lord. For Jesus is the way. He's the truth, and he's the life. No one comes to you but by him. Father, we praise you, Father, that Jesus became the righteous requirement for our sin, that he died for our sin. He died for us, and he died as us on the cross. Victory belongs to Jesus, Lord, and we proclaim that today. Father, we love you. Thank you that we have an eternal relationship with you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You don't realize and recognize how bad you uh, miss getting together until we get together and sing. And uh, I want to thank these guys for being here today and uh, just simply leading us as the Lord is our living hope. Uh, I want to just simply say thank you. Uh, for those that have worked behind the scenes to get us to the place that we're able to uh, simply do what we're able to do online. And uh, thank you for all the Sunday school teachers and all the folks that uh, are continue to be flexible. And thank you, church, for continuing to give online or dropping your uh, tithes and offerings off at the church. And uh, I'm so glad the church isn't closed. Uh, even though uh, a quarantine and a lockdown has um, been instituted, uh, I praise the Lord the gospel goes beyond uh, locked doors and today that's some of the things that we're going to be looking at as Jesus comes and uh, presents himself behind locked doors uh, one of the things I want us to consider today as we've been walking through over the last eight to nine weeks uh, the gospel according to Leviticus and then we looked at the seven cries um, from the cross is what really happened in the resurrection the resurrection is more than just uh, Jesus defeating the grave and resurrecting and bringing life, there's a lot of things that really took place that I think we need, need to uh, understand as we really begin to, to celebrate uh, the resurrection uh, for 2020. And so I want you to take your Bible and uh, keep it open in John chapter 20. John deals with the deity of Christ. And um, in Israel, the Christians in Israel, when they meet each other, the way they know they're Christians, they would say this. One person would say, Jesus Christ is risen. And then if the other person is a believer, they would say, he is risen indeed. And so in the communication in Israel, if a Christian came and said, Christ is risen, the way that they would understand that that other person was a Christian and a believer, they would say, he is risen indeed. And so I stand before you today to tell you that Jesus Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And so today in John chapter 20, as we look at what really is all encompassed in the resurrection, I want you to keep your Bible open. It's 31 verses. We're going to even go into chapter 21 to kind of show you how John lays this out about the deity of Christ. And so there are four truths about the resurrection and uh, that we're going to look at today. There's more than four, but th these four truths I want us to allow to permeate and, and meditate on these truths in our minds as we celebrate not Easter but Resurrection Sunday that is a celebration that we should celebrate every day of our lives because the resurrected life of Jesus lives in us on a daily basis, not just one time a year. And so today as uh, we look at these verses, verses 1 through 31 of John chapter 20, I want us to look and consider four important truths. First point I want us to understand today is the presentation at the resurrection. What is being presented? Now last Sunday we looked at that Jesus said, Into thy hands I commit my spirit, and basically he presented himself to the Father on our behalf so that you and I can now know that there is a, a place after death and Jesus is there and that where he is there we can be also. And so this presentation of the resurrection is three days later he presents himself alive. How does he do that? Why does he do that? And what does that mean to us about this presentation 
of the resurrection. Well, I want to just kind of look at the high points of all these verses and just kind of bring some things out for you today as we look at um, what all is encompassed in the resurrection. First of all, he presents himself openly. Jesus comes and open in outward public, he presents himself alive. There's at least two instances that we're looking at in this passage where Jesus openly comes and basically presents his body, presents his living life to individuals. The first one you find is to Mary. Now Mary has come with, with the other ladies as we read in the other synoptic gospels and they are troubled because they have this idea that there's going to be an obstacle there. And I love how John records that she gets there and finds that the obstacles that she, that she thought she had has been removed. And verse 1, he, it says, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now, while it was still dark is a literal uh, understanding of that it was still dark. It was before daylight. But I believe spiritually in her life, it was spiritually dark. She was still darkened spiritually. And when she began to go to do what she thought was going to simply prepare and finish the preparation of the burial of the body of Christ, she gets there and the obstacle is removed. And so in the way Jesus presents himself, he presents himself openly to her. Now here's the amazing thing because to Mary, he tells Mary not to touch him, not to cling to him. But then that evening on Sunday night church that most people would miss, like Thomas, because Thomas chose not to be there on Sunday night, Jesus presents himself openly in the upper room and tells them to come and touch, to see, and to, to not just see but to touch. And most of us live by our senses instead of the fact. And so I want to give you just some certain truths about this text as we just kind of walk through some high points about um, Jesus presenting himself openly. Why did he do that? Well, Jesus presents himself openly so that these individuals are confident that he's alive. It's not hearsay. It's not something that they are hearing from a, 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 a tale or a, a folklore. It's not some imagination. Here Jesus is standing before individual people that would be later eyewitnesses and I love what John says in his epistle. He says that from the beginning we touched it. We handled it. We saw it. We heard it. We were able to walk with him. And so um, Jesus presents himself openly, and because he presents himself openly now, there are individuals that are confident that he's alive. Not only does he present himself openly and it makes them confident that he's alive, but the Bible says that he convinces them by many proofs. Down in um, verse 30 says, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. And so there are many other proofs that Jesus did to prove that he's alive. One of the most important things that I think you need to see, and we're going to look at it in just a few moments in the book of Acts, that Jesus in the next 40 days is going to continue to teach and preach about the kingdom and how now he's going to be a transitioning that Jesus is not only going to be with them, but now he's going to be living in them as they wait for the day of Pentecost to celebrate the next celebration of the Jewish feast. So not only were they confident that he was alive, he convinced them by many proofs. It says they saw him. The third thing I want you to see is that they're certain that it's real. They touched him. As you look in um, verses 24, 25, and 26, Thomas comes and basically says, you know, I, I, I'm not going to believe what you say until I myself can see and touch. What I, what I love about this text is that Jesus knew what was on Thomas's heart without Thomas knowing that Jesus knew what was on his heart so that when Jesus appeared to him, he said, Thomas, let me explain to you, let me show you, let me put to, put to rest all doubts and fears that you have. Come, see, touch, see my hands, see my side, see, it's me. So they were certain that he was real. They were able to touch him. I'm going to walk you through just two here and then two more in a different passage of Scripture. But 
um, how were they confident that he was alive? What, what did Jesus present himself as? Well, here's what he did. First of all, he presents himself as a comforter to Mary in the garden. In the garden, he comes to Mary and he asks these questions. Mary, why are you weeping? I think it's important that you understand that he asked the same questions that the angels asked. That the message of God, the message from heaven is, why are you worried? Why are you weeping? What's going on? What, 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 is, what has caused you to have this darkness spiritually because Jesus is alive? I love how the other synoptic gospels uh, record this. It says that the angel asks Mary, why do you look for the living among the dead? Most of the time we're looking for the dead among the living. And so the truth of it is, is in the garden, Jesus comes and appears to Mary as a comforter. Not only in the garden in this passage does he come as a comforter, in the upper room we see him as the Christ. So he moves from the garden to the upper room. To Mary, he's a comforter. To the disciples, he's the Christ. He's the one that has paid sin's penalty. He's the one that's fulfilled all of the righteous requirements to be the Messiah. Listen at what the disciples say in verse 20. When Jesus had said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said these, when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you, are, if you retain the sins of any, they're retained. So now here's Jesus coming, and he's basically talking about forgiving of sins. And the Pharisees have already asked, who can forgive sins? Only, only God can do that. And so as Jesus stands before the, the disciples in an upper room, he is convincing them that not only is he the comforter to Mary, he is the Christ to the disciples. Chapter 21, as you read through the, this commentary of what John says about the Lord. In chapter 21, you find that Peter's gone back fishing and he appears again to the disciples and Peter has been fishing in the boat and Jesus has got breakfast on the beach. And everything that they'd been struggling and striving for to catch, Jesus already had prepared. And so as the sun comes up and they begin to see the Lord Jesus then calls out to them and the disciples come and he basically says, have you any food? They say no. John 21 verse 5. Chapter, chapter 21 verse 6. Jesus says to them, cast the net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. Verse 10, he says, bring some of the fish which you've caught. And Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. So Jesus said to them, come and eat breakfast. Then we find in verse 15 where Jesus begins to restore Peter. So to Mary in the garden, he's the comforter. To the disciples in the upper room, he's the Christ. To Peter on the shore, he's the commissioner. He's commissioning Peter to go and to preach and to love and to tend and to shepherd the flock. Luke 24, the Bible says that Jesus appeared to two on the road to Emmaus. He calls them slow to believe, slow hearts. They're sad hearts. They're slow hearts. Then they're smoldering hearts that are burning within them as the Lord communed with them. In Luke 24, Jesus appears to two people, and he's the companion to those two. So the Lord's presenting himself openly to more than just these, but to Mary in the garden, he is the comforter. To the disciples in the upper room, he's the Christ. To Peter on the seashore, he's the commissioner. And to the two on the road to Emmaus, he's a companion. I love what Acts chapter 1, verse 1 through 3 says, and I want to, you to mark this because here is uh, Luke as he's been questioned by Theophilus, and Luke writes and he says, the former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. Listen at this. He both began to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up. 
after he through the Holy Spirit had given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen, here's the word, to whom he also presented himself alive, to whom he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many, here it is, infallible proofs, being seen by them during 40 days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. So what has the Lord done? Not only did he present himself to the Father from the cross, but in the resurrection he presents himself to the earth openly. Come, see, touch. I love what the, the angel says in the book of Mark as he says, come and see where the Lord had laid. He's no longer here, he's risen. The Lord is risen, he is risen indeed. Not only did he present himself openly, verse 17 tells us that he presented himself as an offering. Now I want you to see this as we start trying to tie in what Jesus really did on the cross and what he did in the resurrection. Verse 17, Mary comes and she falls down at his feet and begins to, to worship. And Jesus says to her, do not cling to me. Now, I want you to hear this. Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But I go to my brethren, uh, or but go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Now, to the thief, he said, today you'll be with me in paradise on the cross. On the cross, he said, into thy hands I commit my spirit. What is he saying here? He's saying here in a physical glorified body, he's going to prepare to do the high priestly offering of the first fruit offering. Jesus died on the Passover. Are you listening? Jesus died on the Passover, was resurrected on the first fruit offering. So if you go back to Leviticus 23, you'll find out that there are four feasts that God gave Moses to the children of Israel. So I just want to walk you through that. I want you to turn to Leviticus 23, and I want you to see what Jesus accomplished in the resurrection. In Leviticus 23, 9, we find that the priest has got to present this wave offering. So I want us just to walk through 23 just real quickly and uh, from some high points deal and kind of get your mind understanding what went on on the cross between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. I've made this statement for the last few weeks. There's never a time where the triune God were at odds. There's never a time where the triune God was separated. They're always were together in will and in work. Jesus presents himself on Sunday morning, on the first day of the week, on this festival of first fruit offering, Jesus presents himself not only as the priest, he presents himself as the produce, as the grain. You remember what he says in John uh, where he says, unless a grain of wheat fall into the ground, it remains alone. So what is this idea? Well, first of all, in verses 4 and 5 of Leviticus 23, the first, pass, the first feast that God mentions in his word is the Passover. Now, the Passover is a feast where they would celebrate, where they would kill the, the lamb, slaughter the lamb, put the blood on the doorpost. It's a picture of salvation. So you got to catch these. It's the picture of salvation. So Jesus was our Passover lamb who brought salvation. And in that, he fulfilled the righteous law and requirement of the Passover. That's the reason we don't have to do the Passover. But also, in Leviticus 23, you find in verse 6, the second feast that's mentioned there is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. What did you have to do with unleavened bread? On the, day, on the week of the Passover, you had to go sweep the house, and you had to clean the house with leaven. And so this unleavened bread, this Feast of Unleavened Bread, is a picture of separation. Jesus has now called us out of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And so therefore, Jesus became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God and now we're called out, we're sanctified, separated to do the work that Jesus does on the inside of us. The third feast is the one that we're looking at today because the first fruit offering was always after the spring Passover and it was determined by the moon and the time of, of what's going on, the 14th day, you see all that in, in 
Nisan and uh, the first month of the, of the year for the Jews. But here this third offering in verse 9 of, of Leviticus 23, 9 deals with our sanctification. The Passover deals with our salvation. The unleavened bread deals with our separation. The first fruit offering deals with our sanctification. It speaks of Jesus' resurrection, speaks of our sanctification. Now, I want you to understand what happened and what was to happen on the first fruit offering. Now, remember, three days ago, there was something that happened inside the temple. There was an earthquake. The veil has been torn. The Holy of Holies has now been laid bare. And as Jesus hangs on the cross, is able to look through the temple, sees what's going on, as all the priests are running around trying to figure out what to do. When he says, to tell us thy, it's finished. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Went on the cross at the morning offering, comes off the cross at the evening offering. Now here it is. Sunday, what's, what's supposed to take place? Here's what's supposed to take place. On, on this Sunday, the farmer was to go into the field because yesterday was the Sabbath. We rested. Today, the farmer goes into the field, plucks some sheaves, some grain, which is the first fruit, the first ones that get ripe. That farmer brings it into the temple gives it to the priest. The priest goes in front of the temple and waves the offering. An offering, here it is, it's an offering of thanksgiving. And what the priest was proclaiming was not only what he had in his hand, but what was out in the field was the Lord's. So when you get to John chapter four, and Jesus says, for the field is whitening the harvest. He didn't pray for the harvest. He said pray for the laborers. He won't, we need some more priests waving. We need some more folks that have been separated. We need more folks that's been saved so that the sanctifying work of the Spirit of God with the gospel of Jesus Christ could go forth. It's called the first fruit offering because that's the first fruit that's right. By Jewish law, a sickle could not move into the harvest until the first fruit offering had been presented. Why is this so important? Won't well, you see the titles in the New Testament about Jesus? See, what Jesus really did, yes, he resurrected from the grave. Yes, he fought death, hell, sin, and the grave. Yes, he overcame all of that, but I want you to see what the Word of God says. First of all, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and 23, you find that Jesus is considered the first fruit. Now, the fourth, the fourth, y'all gotta see this, the fourth feast that's in Leviticus 23 is the feast of, uh, of, of Pentecost. 50 days after this day, 50 days from the day is Pentecost. So if unleavened bread is separation, Passover is salvation, first fruit is sanctification, Pentecost is, is spirit-filled living. So I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 and 23, as we deal with this title of first fruit. Listen to what Paul says. As Paul is describing the resurrected body in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, but now Christ is risen from the dead, amen and amen, and has become, listen to this, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. So the Apostle Paul says that what Jesus accomplished in the resurrection on the first fruit offering, the day of the first fruit offering, it wasn't by accident. Paul says he's the first fruit of us and those who had fallen asleep. And by the way, if you look at Matthew 27, there's a lot of people that was resurrected and walked around in Jerusalem in the day the Lord was resurrected. Look at verse 23. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23. He says, but each one in his own order, Christ, the first fruits, afterwards, or afterward, those who are, who are Christ at his coming. So what does that mean? We now have a blessed living hope. We now can 
can claim, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13, that those who sleep in Christ, we're gonna hear a voice of an archangel, a shout and the trumpet of God, and those who are dead in Christ is gonna rise first, and we're gonna go meet the Lord in the air to forever be with him. Why? Because Jesus is our first fruit offering. He is the first fruit of many to follow. Not only is his title the first fruit in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and 23. Look at what James 1, 18. And I think some of our ladies have gone through James, but I want you to see this. It says, of his own will, of the Lord's own will. Listen to what James says. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. I want you to hear this. That we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Jesus doesn't save dogs and cats and cows. He saves human beings. We are the first fruit of his creatures. Can I get an amen? Not only has he got the title of first fruit, but you gotta see this. He's also considered the firstborn. Now, we know that he's the firstborn of Mary, but I want us to walk through what it means to be the firstborn. Well, first of all, Colossians 1.15 says that he's the firstborn of all creation. Now, it doesn't mean that Jesus was created. What this firstborn means is that he's the preeminent, he's the first of the kind, he's unique. When John 3, 16, which says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten. The word begotten means the uniqueness of Christ. It deals with the uniqueness of this one who's man but yet God. He's God but yet man. He was always God and never was he never not God. But yet he came, he took on flesh, and so therefore he veiled the glory of himself in flesh. The uniqueness. He did what only he can do that no man could ever do, so therefore he came in the likeness of man to do what Adam could not do. And because Adam could not do it, Jesus came, and that's the reason he's the last Adam. Jesus isn't the second Adam, he's the last Adam. So let's look at firstborn, Colossians 1.15. What does Colossians 1.15 say? Paul says, he is, the invisible, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all of creation. Amen? There is nothing that was created that was not created by him, for him, and through him. Nothing. All things consist because of him, is what Paul says. He's the firstborn of creation. He's the one that spoke and said, let there be light. Light said, let there be light. Light gave light. Light gave life. Life gave life. It's the light, the life, and the love of God. Not only is he the firstborn of all creation, the Bible says he's the firstborn of the church. But you look at what Hebrews 12, 22 through 24 says. It says, but you have come to Mount Zion. Now, Mount Zion is a literal place. It's one of the three mountains in Jerusalem, but Mount Zion is also Jesus. But you've come to Mount Zion in the city of the living God, Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. You got it? Not physically on a map, but the heavenly Jerusalem. To an innumerable company of angels. Listen to what it says. To the general assembly, watch this, and the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, we've come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better than the things than that of Abel. I praise the Lamb of God that his sacrifice is forever. His sacrifice has instituted the church Upon this rock will I build my church. He's not talking about Peter. He's not even talking about Peter's confession. He's talking about upon himself. Jesus Christ is the firstborn of the church. He's the firstborn of creation. Now, y'all know how my mind works. I have to alliterate everything, not for you, but for me. But the Bible not only says he's the firstborn of all creation, that he's the firstborn of the church, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is the firstborn from the coffin. He's the firstborn from the dead, firstborn of the casket. He's the firstborn from the crib. Whatever you want to put, I had to put a C so I could remember it. Creation, church, coffin, crib, whatever. He's the firstborn from the dead. See, now Jesus can judge the living and the dead. Let's walk through it. Colossians 1.18, Paul in Colossians 1.15 said he's the firstborn of all creation. Listen to what he says in Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body. That's the church, 
right? He's the firstborn. Who is the beginning? Praise the Lord. He is the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. The firstborn from the dead. That in all things, you, listen, that in all things, he may have preeminence. The word preeminence means only. You, listen to me. Jesus Christ is the only one who's resurrected from the dead. You say, well, what about Lazarus? What about uh, the Shulamite woman that received her son back? Let me just say this. They were resuscitated. What do I mean by that? They were brought back to life to die again. In other words, life reentered their same body. What we're talking about today and what we celebrate is the Lord Jesus has a different body. He has a glorified body. He's come in not no longer the likeness of man, but veiled in his own glory. The Bible says that Jesus Christ was resurrected by the glory of the Father. Amen. So his body's different. He walked through locked doors. He knew and was being able, he was able to transpose himself from place to place. Even though he could be touched, he couldn't be handled. Jesus is the firstborn of the dead. I want you to see this, Colossians 1.18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, that in all things, in life and in death, he's the Lord. That in creation and destruction, he's the Lord. That when things are going well, and when the coronavirus hits, he's the Lord. It doesn't make any difference. He is preeminent. He's only over all things. Revelation 1, 4, and 5, I believe John writes this after he gets the revelation of Jesus because in chapter 1, it's all about the revelation of Jesus and him getting instruction. Listen to what it says in verses 4 and 5. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, praise the Lamb of God, which means past, present, and future because he always has been. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, listen to this, what is Jesus Christ? He's the Christ. He's the faithful witness. And John says he's the firstborn from the dead. I love what Jesus says in verse 8. He says he's the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and end, the first and the last. Down in verse 17 in Revelation chapter 1, he says, I am he who holds the keys. I was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore. So here's the question. If he's the Alpha, the Omega, the first and the, the, first and the last, the beginning and the end, and God says that, Jehovah says that, when did God die? The only time God could have died was in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, watch this, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, that in all things he may be, have preeminence, in life and in death. That's the reason I love my life verses of Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am convinced that neither life nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor any created thing. There's nothing high enough, nothing low enough can separate me from the love of Christ or from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Why? Because he has resurrected as the first fruit, as the firstborn, and this title now gives us the blessed living hope that he's coming. So not only do we find the presentation at the resurrection, Number two, what is the promise of the resurrection? You find that in verse number 29, John chapter 20. Here's what Jesus said, Thomas, because you've seen me, you've believed. But here's what Jesus said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. That word blessed means more than just happy. Now I know blessed means happy, but now being blessed by the Lord. What is his promise? His promise is he never leave us nor forsake us. His promise is because he's overcome and now he is the overcomer in us. His promise is that he's given us his joy, not incomplete joy, not the joy that the world gives us, but his joy. What is his promise? His promise is that it's no longer us living but him. That it's his life, not ours that we're in the world but not of the world and we're one with him as him and the Father are one. That blows my mind. The promise of the resurrection. Death has been defeated. 
There's no need to fear the grave. He's released us from the bondage of the fear of death. Hebrews chapter two, verse 14 and 15. So this promise of the resurrection, there's more to come. There's more to come. As my high priest waves the resurrected body, he's saying there's more to come. There's more to come. The firstborn from the dead. As you think about these feasts of Leviticus 23, Jesus becoming the first fruit, I want us to think about it for just a second. And I want us to, to put ourselves in the day of Exodus, in the time of Exodus. Story goes that a, a man had two sons, two Hebrew boys. The oldest son goes to his father and says, Passover's coming, have you chose the lamb? Did you choose the right lamb? Let's make sure we do it right. The youngest son comes and he says, Daddy, did you, did you do it the way Moses told us to do it? Have you given it to the priest? Have you done all the things that you've done? And as he watched his daddy put it over the doorpost, the son begins to go down. The, the youngest son is still worried about it. He says, Daddy, you think the blood's still there? Daddy, you think the blood's still there? He would run and look out the door and make sure the blood's still there. The, the oldest son has trusted the father and goes to bed. All during the night, midnight hour, the youngest son would get up and run outside to check and make sure the blood was still on the doorpost. He stayed up all night, wringing his hand, worried to death about it. The son came up the next morning. The younger son walks in and sees the older son getting out of bed. Oldest son has slept all night long. Why do I give you the story? Because both of those boys was in a house that was safe and secure because of the blood. But only one of those boys rested. See, you got to understand that Jesus Christ became your Passover lamb. But you got to rest in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus. And then you got to trust that he's the firstborn of the dead. He's the firstborn of all of creation. As my priest, my high priest, waves the wave offering and said, I've overcome the grave, who's always leading us into victory, Paul says. There's more to come. There's more to this story than just a rock being rolled away. Not only is the promise of the resurrection in verse 29, I want you to see the proving of this resurrection. What does the resurrection prove? Look at verse 30. Well, verse 30 says, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in the book. Verse 31, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now I want you to see this. There's two important truths about verse 30 and 31. What is this proving of the resurrection? The proving of the resurrection is this. There are many other signs. There's proofs that Jesus is alive. You say, well, Brother Brad, how can you prove it? Well, this is not a Brad gospel. It's not a man-centered gospel. But I'm telling you right now, how do I know he lives? Because he lives in me. I serve a risen Savior. Who's in the world today? <laughs> Why? Because he lives in me. The living proofs. The Bible says that he appeared to over 500 at one time. He appeared over the next 40 days of the resurrection as he makes his way to Pentecost. There are many other signs that he did. But what was the purpose? What is the purpose of the resurrection? The purpose of the resurrection you find at the end of verse 31. That you may believe and have the life that resurrected himself. Jesus had the power to lay it down and the power to take it back up again. It is that power that Jesus, don't, he doesn't just impart, but he imputes inside of you. Paul, we're gonna look at that, what Paul says about that in just a few moments. So what is this proving of the resurrection? The resurrection proves that Jesus was not mere man. The resurrection proves that we have been sanctified, that we have been justified, and that we will be glorified. 
the resurrection proves that not only is the cross and the work of the cross accomplished and finished, but now it's been accepted and my high priest now lives to make intercession on my behalf and there's ultimate proofs in heaven every time Satan attacks me and the only time he tells the truth is saying that Brad's a sinner and he deserves to go to hell and that he ought to be in the, the kingdom of darkness. But Jesus says, here's the proof that he's mine. So not only is the proof many signs, the purpose is that you may believe and have life in his name. The fourth thing I want you to understand, and we'll wrap this up, and not only is there the presentation that he presented himself openly and he presented himself as an offering, not only was there a promise and not only is there proving, the last point I want to make to you is this. I want you to understand the participants of the resurrection. Now, I could stand here for over an hour and give you many different participants, but I just want to hit some high points for you. First of all, you find that the participants of the resurrection was, was two individuals specifically named in the preparation for the resurrection. See, most people didn't prepare. See, over the last 100 years, Resurrection Sunday morning has been about bows and bonnets and dresses and suits and ties. But the Lord's locked us down to prove to us that it's about him. And so the participants in the resurrection are two individuals that's named in the book of John right before John chapter 20, at the close of, of 19, I want you to see this. These two men are Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. Now, I want to just show you just a couple things right here about these two men. First of all, the participants in the resurrection, Joseph of Arimathea had the place. It was his tomb that Jesus was going to borrow. I'm so glad that I've had the opportunity to go and look and walk and see that which they think is the tomb. Here's what's amazing. Today, Resurrection Sunday morning, I was raised going to Easter sunrise service. I'm telling you right now, I don't care how early you get up in the morning, you ain't gonna sneak up on Jesus. We used to get up and go into the graveyard and watch the sunrise. Jesus ain't there. He's alive. You're not gonna sneak up on him. I've been there. He's alive. He's not there. I want you to hear this. In our group, we walk through it every day and come into the close of our tour, the, the day before we left, we get to the tomb. One of the preachers there said, this is, the whole, this is what I've been waiting on. I've been waiting on going into the tomb. I said, did you not believe he wasn't there? Did you have to see it for your own self? Amen. Who are the participants? Joseph of Arimathea had the place. But listen to me, Nicodemus had the perfume. These two individuals laid their life on the line to make sure that Jesus had a proper burial. Little did they know that the scriptures was being fulfilled by what they were doing. I love what John 20 says. John 20 says that the disciples had not yet known the scriptures about him being resurrected. That's what it says. And so as we look at this preparation or these participants as those who prepared for it, Amen. John 19, 38 through 42, it says, After this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for the fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take, take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. That's a lot. That's a lot. See, Joseph of Arimathea had the place. Nic Nicodemus had the perfume. Then they took the body of Jesus and bound it in strips of linen with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because the Jews' preparation day for the tomb was nearby. So not only do you have the prep preparing for the resurrection, you got those who were in the presence of the resurrection. Who were the ones that were in the presence of the resurrection? Well, we've already talked about it. Mary, in the garden, Jesus became a, com a comforter. Mary and the other women, in the presence of the Lord, they had faith. The disciples had fear. So Jesus had to say, peace, shalom. Why are you fearful? What's wrong with you? So those in the presence of the Lord, 
Mary and the other women had faith. The disciples had fear, but there's 500 at one time had a fact. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6. I want you to hear what 1 Corinthians 15, 6 says. Because Paul wants us to understand that Jesus didn't, wouldn't swoon and then got up and, you know, he really wasn't dead or that they went to the wrong tomb or all these ideas that's gone around that the soldiers stole the body. Listen, Paul said he was dead. Mary and the other women went. Here's what he says. And after that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. What is he saying? He's saying these people, the majority of the 500 are eyewitnesses that I've talked to. Amen. So the presence of the resurrection, these people got into the presence. They saw him openly back to that presentation of the resurrection. The final point that I want you to understand is the power of the resurrection. Paul says that I may know him, Philippians 3.10, and the power of his resurrection, the dunamis of his resurrection. Let me just give you an understanding and some scripture to kind of hang your hat on. First of all, I want you to understand, as I've already said, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit was always in communion. On the cross, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit was in communion. There was a praise time. There was a prayer time. There was a time of worship. Amen. Three important truths. First of all, God the Father was in the resurrecting of the Lord. Just like God the Father was in the crucifying of the Lord. Isaiah 53 said it pleased the Father to, to bruise him and to crush him. Let's look at this. Romans 6.4. I love what Paul says in Romans 6.4. Paul says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism unto death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead, here it is, by the glory of the Father. It is the glory of the Father that resurrected the Son says, even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. Why? Because he's the first fruit. There's many to follow. Not only in Romans 6, 4, Paul says it to the church of Colossians, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 12. Here's what he says. Buried with him in baptism. Almost the same thing he says in Romans, right? Buried with him in baptism. In which you, listen, in which you also were, were, were raised with him through faith. Here it is. In the working of God who raised him from the dead. Not only was God the Father the power of the resurrection, don't you see what God the Son says? God the Son says in John 10, verse 18, here's what Jesus says, no one takes it from me, no one takes my life from me, here's what he says, but I lay it down of myself. I have the power to lay it down and I have the power to take it again. This command I've received from my Father, this text we looked at last week. It is the Lord. It is his power. He was never defeated. There's a lot of people that think that Jesus was hanging on a cross, that Satan had him whipped. Let me tell you something. Satan was never in the game. There's a lot of people believe that, you know, Jesus was down by two, and with three seconds left on the clock, Jesus ran out there and kicked a field goal on the resurrection and beat him by one. Let me tell you, Satan never was ahead. God the Son had the power to lay it down, had the power to resurrect, it, resurrect himself. God the Father, God the Son, don't you see what God the Spirit and the power of the resurrection, that how he participated in the resurrection. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, For Christ also suffered once for sin, the just for the unjust. Y'all remember in the book, the book of Leviticus? When we looked at Leviticus 14, Leviticus 16, the escape goat, the just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God, watch this, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. So it was the glory of the Father, it was the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, and it was the power of the Son by the command that the Father gave the Son that all three worked collectively together in the power of the resurrection. Not only in 1 Peter 3, 18, don't you see what Paul says to the church of Rome in Romans 8, 11. He says, but if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the, door, from the dead dwells in you, he's talking about me and you, He's talking about that sanctifying work of the first fruit, the firstborn. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, who raised Jesus from the dead? The spirit of God. If he lives in you, he who raised Christ from the dead, watch this, 
will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. He's now a life-given spirit and a spirit-given life. The person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in the resurrection as he became the first fruit offering, as he presents himself openly and as an offering, as he proclaims and gives us a promise that there's more to come, that he proclaims and gives us the proving of many other proofs that the purpose is that we may believe and have life. And the participation is, do we prepare? Do we participate in the presence of the resurrected Lord on the inside of us? Or do we live our lives as the younger son? What am I going to do? What are we going to do? Let's make sure it's there. Let's cross the T's and dot the I's. Or are we going to be the oldest son and go, you know what? The father's done it. The blood's there. I'm going to rest in the person and the work of the lamb. I'm so glad that Jesus Christ not only was my burnt offering, not only was my sin offering, not only was he my peace offering, not only was he my trespass offering, he's my free will thanksgiving offering and my meal offering as my priest waves it going, there's more to come. There's more to come. Ladies and gentlemen, let me say this to you. Church, please hear me. Your best life is not now. Your best life is to come. How do I know that? Because the one who was my high priest stands and waves a wave offering saying the best is yet to come. That he's the first fruit. That he's the firstborn from the dead. And I don't have to fear death because now Paul says absent from the body is present with the Lord. How do I know that? Because Jesus said into thy hands I commit my spirit. Jesus said to tell us thy. Jesus quoted Psalm 22. Jesus said today you'll be with me in paradise. And as he stands between heaven and and earth as my high priest waving the sheave offering. I can stand before you today and say that the resurrection encompasses a whole lot more than Easter bonnets and bows. It encompasses more than fake grass and plastic eggs. It encompasses more than a coronavirus. His name is Jesus. And God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit has been satisfied and they make intercession on my behalf. They are my, my judge, but yet they're my justice. They're my grace. So for those who participate through believing, Jesus says, they believe in the person and the work of Christ. We can now go with the power of the resurrection, with the promise of the resurrection, with the purpose of the resurrection, with the proofs of the resurrection, with the program of the resurrection, and most importantly, we go with the presentation of the resurrection. His life, not mine. It is his life that I rest in. So today, I want to ask you this question. Does your house have the blood of the Lamb? figuratively, spiritually speaking, over the door because he is the door. Can you rest that the death angel is going to pass over because of the blood of the Lamb? If you say yes and you're safe and you're secure inside the home, I want to ask you this question. Are you like the oldest son or the younger son? Are you constantly running back making make sure you crossed the T's, dotted the I's, confessed it, stayed prayed up, did all the right stuff and had your religion. If that's the case, then you really believe that there's salvation by works and you'll never rest in the purpose and the promise and the power of the resurrection. What am I saying? The writer of Hebrews says that he who believes, he who trusts in the Lord, he himself has ceased from his own work. 
just as the Father has ceased from his. So the word for 2020. We don't need a stimulus package. We don't need a government to bail us out. We don't need doctors and lawyers. We need the only one who is the firstborn, who is the first fruit. His name is Jesus. Whether it be life or death, he is the Lord. Do you know him? Has there ever been a time where Jesus Christ has deposited his life into you? I can say this. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. You ask me, why do I do what I do? Because I'm telling you right now, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Do you know him? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. But Lord, I thank you that you live to make intercession on our behalf. Those who believe, may the power of the resurrection, may the presence of the resurrection and the promise and the participants understand the proof and the proving that as you present yourself openly to us, would you present yourself openly through us? Lord, would you be honored and glorified in a very uncertain day? May you be the certainty of the church. May you rule and reign. And may we say, like the Apostle Paul, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings that maybe, just maybe, we could obtain the resurrection. We could understand really what all went on, not only through your life and work, not only through the cross, but in the resurrection as you wave the wave offering in thanksgiving that it all belongs to the Lord, but the best is yet to come. Would you be honored and glorified in how we respond? I thank you for this church. I thank you for New Prospect Baptist Church who continues to give, continues to be flexible. And God, I long for the day we can get back together. God, they can have the building. Would you give me the people? Would you simply allow us to get together?